Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Clay, and I'm with JBS International. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Improving Outcomes for Patients with Communicable Diseases and Substance Use Treatment Settings. Before we begin, I'd like to review some housekeeping items. Due to the high number of participants on this call, all participant lines will be muted for the duration of this webinar session. If you have any comments or questions, please submit them at any time by using the Q&A window. To open your Q&A window, please click on the Q&A icon that's located in the bottom center of your Zoom window. Closed captioning is also available. To turn on closed captioning, click the CC icon that's located on the bottom of your screen or use the link that's available in the chat. If you experience any technical issues during this webinar, please message us using the chat feature, which is located at the bottom center of your screen, or email us at samhastatea at jbsinternational.com. Lastly, this is a recorded event and your participation grants consent to be recorded. The recorded webinar and PowerPoint slides will be available and sent to participants at a later date. Next slide. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Next slide. I'm now take a moment to introduce our two presenters for this afternoon's webinar. Dr. Niraj Gendotra serves as the Chief Medical Officer for SAMHSA. Previously, Dr. Gendotra served as the Chief Medical Officer for a nationwide addiction treatment network where he has developed national strategies specifically aimed at reducing risk and improving outcomes. Dr. Gendotra began his addiction career in public health, serving an underserved community in Washington, D.C., where he developed his perspective of how a nationwide approach to addiction treatment is needed. As medical director of addiction treatment services at Johns Hopkins, he directed patient care through implementation of department initiatives and medical center resources. Dr. Gandotra has also worked as a medical director for federally qualified health centers, where it was necessary to develop policies mindful of specific catchment area needs. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Gandotra is a member of the American Society of Addiction Medicine and the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. Kristen Roja is a public health advisor at SAMHSA, where she helps craft the agency's response to the syndemics of HIV, viral hepatitis, STIs, substance use disorders, and mental illness. She also serves as the co-lead for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment's Minority AIDS Initiative Grant Portfolio. Prior to her work with SAMHSA, Ms. Roja served as an epidemiologist in the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator at the U.S. Department of State, during which she oversaw PEPFAR implementation in the Caribbean, Central Asia, West Africa, and Southern Africa. Prior to entering federal service, Ms. Roja worked on public health intervention trials in Rwanda and Malawi. Ms. Roja holds advanced degrees in paleopathology global health communications, and epidemiology. I'll now turn to Dr. Gandotra to begin this afternoon's presentation. Dr. Gandotra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the contracting team for putting together this webinar. And on behalf of Secret Assistant Secretary Miriam Delphin Rittman, I'd like to thank all of you for attending this important webinar. And of course, our Center for Substance Abuse Treatment uh, Director, Dr. Ingvild Olson. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is really related to uh, not just infectious disease, but the idea that we have a, uh, we have a duty to treat the whole person to treat all their conditions and not just, uh, not just in a subsequent or sequential nature, but concurrent care is actually the ideal and the better way to approach things. And we know that there is a significant intersection between communicable diseases and substance use disorder and mental health. Uh, I will be providing some of the medical background and perspectives on a host of communicable diseases 
such as HIV, viral hepatitis B and C, syphilis, and tuberculosis. And uh, my colleague, Kristen Roja, will be going over many of the uh, resources that SAMHSA has for managing these conditions in behavioral health settings. Next slide, please. I have no disclosures to report, no conflicts of interest. Next slide. So today our objectives are quite clear. We're gonna talk about the medical rationale of why integrated care is important, in particular for infectious disease screening and management. We're gonna review some of the prevalence data for the CDC and WHO, and we're gonna describe uh, selected SAMHSA resources and funding opportunities that support integrated care, especially in the infectious disease space. Next slide. So why are we even talking about this? We know that there's a high level of comorbidities between people with mental illness and substance use disorder and communicable diseases. We also know that the behavioral health workforce challenges contribute to an unmet need of these services. And integration really does align with providing a, a holistic, whole person and person-centered care approach. And equally important is that the costs of not integrating care really do go up. There's the cost of untreated mental illness and substance use disorder when it's not recognized, and certainly the costs of medical comorbidities when they're untreated with people of these uh, people have these conditions. And then, of course, when the mental health conditions are worsening, certainly compliance for the physical health conditions in terms of adherence to medication schedules and screenings go way down. So it's very important that we take an integrated care approach. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna take a minute just to talk about SAMHSA's strategic plan. Now the mission and vision speak for themselves, but I'd like to call to attention in particular, our priority goals. And priority goal four, integrating behavioral and physical health care is where most of what our talk today will be focused upon. But certainly we have, oh, we have priorities in several spaces, preventing substance use and overdose, enhancing access to suicide prevention and mental health services, promoting resilience uh, and emotional health for children, youth, and families, and strengthening the behavioral health workforce. And within the strategic plan, we have cross-cutting principles of equity trauma-informed approaches, recovery, and a commitment to data and evidence. Much of the data I'll be discussing today will be coming from the CDC and WHO, um, but we gather data from our partners in the states, our grantees, and a number of other sources. And really, I like to say that our policies are informed by what you tell us. We rarely know all of the important aspects of the care you deliver unless you let us know. And we, quite frankly, can't dictate from D.C. or Rockville what a community in Louisiana, California, New York, or any other place needs. So we need your help in that partnership. Next slide. So integrated care can mean lots of things. Uh, it could mean coordinated care, co-located, or full integration. Now, coordinating care may be simply a, uh, an effort to screen for a particular condition and then refer to an, another entity or facility for actual care. It may involve case management and navigation through sometimes a very complicated healthcare system, in particular those with mental illness or substance use disorder, when, they're, when their distress is greater, navigating through a complicated system can prove challenging. And then co-located care goes a step further, that either in the same campus, the same building, or even the same floor, the, the services are delivered. The same clinic may be able to provide, for instance, infectious disease screening, and also um, help with regard to uh, a neighboring facility being able to manage other conditions as well. And then as we move further down the spectrum, really, that's the goal, the system level integration. And this, you know, many places do already. This may be an electronic healthcare record that is 
equally accessed among various specialties. It certainly involves multidisciplinary teams and clinical information systems. It may involve uh, accessible population-based registries. And ultimately though, this really is to support a more holistic decision uh, protocol. And I'd be remiss to not mention financing because financing for integrated care is how this will be sustainable. And ultimately, it does improve the system and the quality metrics that we'll be hopefully able to, uh, to put forward and measure as patients do better in terms of compliance with both their physical health and their mental health and substance use disorder management. Next slide, please. So while this slide really does talk about HIV, I think it does apply to most infectious diseases. And that really is that when we talk about an infectious disease and substance use disorder and mental health conditions, they do interact in a complex fashion. And each acts as a potential catalyst or obstacle for the treatment of the other two conditions. We know already when it comes to substance use disorder, when individuals engage in treatment for their substance use condition, they'll begin to engage in other treatment seeking behaviors. They'll take care of their primary care appointments, they'll get health insurance, they'll take care of uh, other obligations that have been um, that have been put to the wayside because their substance use disorder wasn't properly managed. But also, it's important to understand that substance use can increase the risk of contracting infectious diseases. In particular for HIV, it's substantially associated with the use of contaminated needles when individuals inject heroin. But substance use disorder can uh, treatment can also, and this goes for mental health treatment as well, serve as permit prevention for infectious disease. Because when we place the, the person in the, in the substance use disorder treatment or mental health treatment continuum of care, that really does help minimize some of those risky behaviors that, that lead to the contraction or exacerbation of a infectious disease. In fact, there's a risk, the risk reduction is part of a comprehensive approach to, uh, to prevention. And really, this does promote the idea that if we can change the person's substance use disorder trajectory, we'll be able to change other behaviors too, uh, whether that be in the form of harm reduction, risk reduction with regard to uh, sex-related behaviors, or other conditions. We are able to really reduce the risk of contracting or transmitting infectious disease. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a bit about hepatitis, uh, both B and C, but in general, hepatitis is a general term for liver inflammation. And it can be caused by a number of things, viruses, chemicals, drugs, alcohol, and even genetic disorders. But today we're gonna to be talking about viral hepatitis and that includes types A, B, C, D, and E. And each type of hepatitis has a different way of being transmitted, its severity, geographical distribution, but B and C are the most common types and most likely to be encountered and uh, encountered in substance use and behavioral health care settings. And they're the leading causes of liver cirrhosis, liver cancer, and uh, viral hepatitis related deaths. Now, hepatitis can be acute or chronic and acute hepatitis flares flares up suddenly and then goes away, while chronic hepatitis is a long-term condition that leads to progressive liver damage. And some individuals are at higher risk for developing uh, hepatitis. Those who share needles, practice, have unprotected sex, have many sex partners, or engage in risky behaviors uh, while intoxicated. Now, some people with hepatitis have no symptoms, uh, but while others experience symptoms such as yellowing of the skin and eyes, poor appetite, vomiting, tiredness, and abdominal pain. There are other risk factors as well. Uh, of course, uh, homelessness um, is one, having poor nutritional status, working in a hospital uh, or nursing home, uh, receiving long-term kidney dialysis, and living in areas with poor sanitation. Uh, next slide, please. 
So hepatitis B is an infection of the liver caused by the hepatitis B virus. The infection can be acute, and that will be short and severe, or chronic. And hepatitis B can cause a chronic infection that puts people at risk of death from cirrhosis or liver cancer. It can be spread through contact with infected body fluids, such as blood, saliva, vaginal fluids, or semen. It can also be passed from mother to her, uh, to her child. Hepatitis B can be prevented uh, with safe and effective vaccines. The vaccine is often given soon after birth with boosters a few weeks later, and it offers almost 100% protection against the virus. Next slide, please. So this is some data from the WHO, and um, you can see that this, uh, the, as well as the CDC, I want to be clear that most of the information that I'll be discussing is from the CDC. Um, hepatitis is endemic in certain areas, and most likely it's commonly spread through a, a, number, of a, a number of pathways that we've already discussed, whether that be uh, through birth, uh, at childbirth, through perinatal transmission, or through exposure to infected blood. Now, the development of the chronic infection in humans, uh, in human infants, is really, um, it, it will really be shown up early. And that's something that I want to take a moment to talk about, is that most mothers are going to be screened, and this is part of routine care. And I want to be clear that routine care is really, when it comes to hepatitis screening and treatment, is, should be the standard. And the CDC has a number of guidelines that many, many hospitals have undertaken. And in reality, it is something that should be not only thought of as a public health endeavor, but it's also cost saving in terms of major comorbidities later in life. And, and that's the other part to this is that while the transmission can occur through a multiple number of ways, once it's there, we have to address it. And certainly vaccination can do wonders for reducing the comorbidities as well. Now, hepatitis B infections acquired in adulthood lead to chronic hepatitis in less than 5% of the cases. And while it compared to uh, infancy and early childhood, that leads to chronic hepatitis in almost 95% of the cases. That's why it's important to, to really do that screening of the newborn right away and ensure the treatment begins uh, in short order. Uh, a couple of things about hepatitis that aren't necessarily listed here that are that's important to understand is that, and why it's so important with regard to safe practices is that it can survive outside the body for at least seven days. And during that time, it can still cause infection if it enters the body, someone who's unprotected by the vaccine. Now that incubation period can be anywhere from 30 to 180 days. And the virus can certainly be detected for a uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, we, we think about the virus once it's in, in the body, it can be detected within 30 to 60 days. And it's important to recognize that while hepatitis is widespread across the world, there are some populations that have higher rates. Certainly in the, the some of the highest rates are in the Appalachian regions. And there's states, uh, hopefully, that are listening that have public policies that are addressing this at, at this time. Um, and certainly the rates of acute hepatitis virus are higher in black populations. Uh, CDC estimates that oh, almost 640,000 adults have chronic hepatitis B. Next slide. So as I mentioned, vaccines are very effective. Hepatitis B is preventable with a vaccine. Vaccination efforts are, are really the cornerstone for preventing spread of, of this condition. And all, uh, just as a piece of data, you know, when we started doing uh, C, uh, the CDC recommended child vaccinations, the, the rates of hepatitis B in children plummeted. And in, it's important to recognize that all babies should receive the hepatitis B vaccine after birth, uh, and probably two or three uh, doses afterwards of at least four weeks apart as boosters. And this is really important to prevent later uh, uh, later uh, contraction of hepatitis B. So this is really a preventive measure that I think a lot, a lot of folks have 
have now undertaken across the world and in various states, but it really doesn't improve outcomes for infants and children. And you can see the other groups that the CDC recommends to be, um, uh, to be vaccinated, certainly all infants, children and adolescents less than 19 years of age, adults 19 to 59, and then adults who are over 60 at high risk. So essentially everyone should have received the vaccine at some point in their lives. And this way we can, we can decrease the risk of the comorbidities that come with chronic hepatitis infections. Next slide, please. So we do advise testing and certainly uh, testing is another part to this because if you don't diagnose the condition, how are you gonna treat it? How are you going to address it? Of course, all pregnant, uh, and uh, pregnant people, uh, infants who are born uh, to mothers with hepatitis B infections, anyone who has risk factors. And, you know, those risk factors are something I'll go over in the next slide, please. So the risk factors are really having unprotected sex with multiple partners or someone who has hepatitis B virus, uh, drug injections, um, injecting drugs, or uh, sharing needles is, is a very important risk factor that we've done wonders with when it comes to education. And this is something that I, I can't speak enough about, is that our patients really do understand risk when it comes to uh, education of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, that if we educate them about that and we provide resources to avoid sharing of needles or equipment, that are used for injecting drugs, or for that matter, for piercing, tattooing, anything that were, where bodily fluids could be exchanged, they do employ those practices and they're able to reduce infections. Um, there's other things that folks can do, certainly practice safe sex using condoms, reducing the number of sexual partners, um, and, of, and of course, ensuring that uh, if they are in contact with any body fluids, that they do get tested. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to take a moment, step on the soapbox for a moment, because this stigma is another part to this that is, is really underlying much of, of why this has been a problem and a barrier. Um, you know, stigma around hepatitis B is often is often caused by an understanding that is unfounded about how the virus is transmitted. And many people believe in myths that this virus can be transmitted through casual contact. And that, that leads to individuals then being isolated, feeling shame. And in particular, people who inject drugs sometimes lack access to these treatments that may be available due to the stigma that's attached to substance use disorder. And it's very common that these stigmas are sometimes associated with negative connotations of them being engaged in dangerous behaviors, that they're unpredictable or they lack control. But we know that substance use disorder is a chronic disease and it's important to treat it as such, uh, not as some moral failing. And some of these stigmas then include being poorly treated in healthcare facilities while interacting with staff. And due to those biases, sometimes patients will refuse to seek care. So it's important to treat uh, the whole person and understand that whatever brought them in that day, that they shouldn't be judged. Uh, they've scraped together enough resources to overcome the barriers to get them in front of you. And at that moment, it's important that they receive holistic care uh, because the substance use disorder is actually trying to, if we were to give it a personality, trying to get them to leave that treatment setting because it definitely can't survive in the treatment setting. And understanding that we have a duty to ensure that once patients enter our facilities, we're able to give them that holistic care. Um, so next slide. So what should we do? Really, when we talk about the recommendations, uh, we're really talking about individuals who might be at high risk for hepatitis B. Uh, but we need to assess that risk. And that risk can only be assessed by asking questions in a way that is 
uh, non-confrontational, non-judgmental, and it helps, the, helps them open up to you about this. Now, the risk, uh, certainly we already have covered, sharing injection equipment, uh, lack of awareness of how hepatitis B is transmitted, using unclean needles to inject drugs. Um, these all increase the person's risk of being exposed to the virus. Uh, we do need to know about their history of vaccination and we need to review those risk factors. We screen if there's any of those behaviors that have been in, uh, in, their, in, their, past, in their past medical history. And then we will vaccinate. Um, there are instances where we have to treat them. And treatment, while it can be a bit complicated uh, with regard to the schedule that has to be uh, undertaken, because the treatment is generally daily for life, it has been very effective. But most importantly, the care of uh, acute hepatitis should be focused on making the person comfortable. Uh, giving them information about how to keep themselves healthy, how to avoid some of the uh, side effects of dehydration, and then most, and then making sure that they're compliant with the medication. You know, these medications can be taken orally, and they slow the advance of the cirrhosis. They reduce the cases of liver cancer, and they really do improve long-term survival. But it's important to recognize that education is going to be key. We have to ensure that. Uh, you know, we follow the guidelines, but it's estimated that over 50% of those individuals with chronic hepatitis B will need treatment. And individuals in low income settings, those who might, um, might have the diagnosis later in course, we have to, we have to address that disparity. Uh, that really healthcare access starts with the screening and assessing the risk and getting them vaccinated. And then we can avoid the long-term complications of cirrhosis, liver failure, and then sometimes even uh, the need for transplantation if they're eligible. Next slide. So hepatitis C has certainly been more, uh, more visible as of late, uh, as we know that Hepatitis C also, while it's a, it's transmitted by a virus through a blood exposure, it has traveled very closely with, it, with HIV and other infectious diseases for those with substance use disorder. And while it's primarily transmitted through exposure of infectious blood or body fluids, it can also be acute or chronic. But there is an important difference that, it, that I'd like to just highlight. Certainly that, you know, there are curative treatments for hepatitis C. I want to say that again, that there is a way to cure if someone is infected with hepatitis C. But acute hepatitis is usually occurs within six months of exposure. And while that's a short-term illness, the acute infection often leads to a chronic infection. And that can be a lifelong infection if left untreated. And more than half of the people do, who develop, uh, who become infected with hepatitis C will will develop that chronic infection. And that certainly leads to similar health problems of liver damage, cirrhosis, liver cancer, and even death. And in 2022, I say that nearly 13,000 individuals had, their, uh, had hepatitis C reported as their underlying cause of death on their death certificates. And we think that estimate is actually quite low as sometimes the data doesn't indicate individuals who've been who die of hepatitis C. But the death rates are far higher among Native Americans and non-Hispanic Blacks, uh, almost uh, three, and a, three and a half times greater for Native Americans and one and a half, one and a half times greater for, for non-Hispanic Blacks. So it's important to recognize that there are going to be populations that we have to have greater outreach for. And the most important part is that, again, those in low income settings, underserved areas, are the ones who are most likely to be diagnosed late and to be dealing with greater comorbidity. So the, so the screening for everyone is going to be key, as well as the idea that we're able to offer a curative solution. And that is something that I, I have to just push again and again, because the federal government has undertaken efforts 
to ensure that access to this cure is available. Certainly, we know that uh, that this cure, while while certain while can be difficult for some patients to take, is only a 12-week course, and then they can be cured of hepatitis C. So there's no reason that we can't be addressing this uh, aggressively. Uh, next slide. So what are the risk factors for hepatitis C? Um, you know, we've talked about individuals who, who inject drugs or did so in the past. Um, also individuals who have co-occurring infections such as HIV and people who've ever received um, hemodialysis uh, certainly that's something that could also be, uh, uh, the, 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 there could be more, uh, that we could do. I want to say that while we're able to identify many of the risk factors, we're learning more and more about this. Certainly transfusions are another one, but, uh, the most important thing is, is that we screen individuals at, at, at any time where we believe that they're they're engaging in risk, we address that risk. We educate folks on the reasons uh, how they can mitigate uh, their exposure. Next slide. So un unlike hepatitis B, there is no effective vaccine for hepatitis C. Uh, so the best way to prevent it is avoiding behaviors that uh, expose or spread the disease. But if you suspect someone has been has been exposed, testing and treatment is is really uh, important. Now I know that uh, some states have various funding mechanisms that can allow for accessing the treatment, and some pharmaceutical companies are have been very generous. And the federal government is working on plans to make the models for delivery of such. Uh, such curative uh, mechanisms, these medications, more available. But these are an eight to 12 week course. Clinicians certainly should screen all adults age 18 or older at least once. And, uh, and that really is the way to at least identify those who are available, uh, who, who may be at risk, and then where treatments may be available. So despite the treatment saving lives, you know, we know that the treatment access or treatment uptake has been low for a variety of reasons with relation to the cost of the medication, availability, uh, and quite frankly, the workforce being educated on where those things may be available. So hopefully that's something that we'll be getting into as well. Next slide. So we're going in the home stretch with regard to some of the infectious diseases. We've, you know, there's a federal effort to ending the HIV epidemic that um, that we have been engaged in for almost a decade, and we're looking for uh, for making even more progress in this area. A little bit of background for those who may not know about HIV, or just a little refresher. It's a certainly we know that the human human immunodeficiency virus attacks the immune system, and without treatment, it can lead to AIDS. And People who get HIV typically will get it through sexual contact, sharing of needles, uh, syringes, or other drug injection equipment. Um, and it's important to recognize that these fluids must then come in contact with the mucous membrane or damaged tissue or be directly injected into the bloodstream. Uh, it's not going to be transmitted through casual contact. And certainly there are factors that can increase person's risk of uh, getting or transmitting HIV, uh, such as other sexually transmitted infections, uh, drug use, uh, or alcohol use as well. Next slide, please. So HIV can be prevented and treated. We do now, uh, from where we were in the 80s till now, there have been significant advancements in, in the data and science with regard to how to manage <clears throat> how to manage this condition. And I will say that some of the patients I see in my mental health clinic who may have a, HIV, uh, you know, they didn't expect to live this long. There have been, you know, their their late middle ages and they're able to go about their lives. They didn't expect 
that they would be dealing with some of the old age issues when they first contracted this condition. And that's because of the treatment that's become available and the effectiveness of that treatment. Now, while there's no effective cure, once someone has HIV, they have it for life, proper medical care can control the virus. People who have HIV get on and stay on the HIV treatment. They can live long, healthy lives. And today there's even more tools that will help prevent, um, prevent HIV transmission. Certainly we know about use of condoms, not sharing needles, but also the use of pre-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis, depending on the situation. Uh, these, are th uh, these are particular medication regimens that are able to reduce the risk of contracting HIV. So individuals who have engaged in, in a, a sex with a partner with HIV uh, or consistently don't use condoms, or if they've been diagnosed with other sexually transmitted diseases in the past six months, or if they inject drugs, or have a partner who injects drugs, these are individuals who might qualify for PrEP. And these are, and PrEP has been very effective in, in decreasing the risk of transmitting HIV or uh, contracting HIV. Next slide, please. So post-exposure prophylaxis forces the other side, and this is the use of the antiretroviral drugs after a high-risk event, and it must be taken within three days of possible exposure. And it's important that folks uh, talk to their healthcare providers as soon as possible if they believe that they've been engaged, uh, if they've been exposed, and most importantly, when it comes to that aspect, that really speaks to stigma, healthcare access, and a number of barriers that keep people from talking about it. Uh, but what are those exposures again? You know, sharing needles or equipment used to inject, but individuals who've been sexually assaulted, uh, individuals who, who have unprotected sex, these are all places, uh, these are all situations where uh, post-exposure prophylaxis is indicated. Next slide. So I, this is from the WHO, and really, I wanted to just put up this slide is that even though we would work in towards this, it's still a worldwide crisis. Uh, while we've made a lot of progress with regard to PrEP and PEP access here, uh, throughout the world, we've still been dealing with uh, significant mortality. Debts have been trending down within the United States, though, when it comes to improved treatment. Um, and that's something that I, I want to say has, has been a long steady decline. When we look on the CDC's uh, web pages, we see it tracking down almost from 1996. And uh, really we, we wanna speak to education efforts being uh, the mainstay of why we've been able to see that, that downtrend, which we hope will continue as we continue to marshal resources towards this. Next slide. So some of you may be aware of the Assistant Secretary for Health's uh, syphilis task force, and we've really been working towards trying to enhance uptake of resources for syphilis, uh, uh, recognition, screening, and treatment. Uh, a little bit of medical background. Uh, syphilis is also a sexually transmitted disease that will cause serious health conditions if left untreated. And it develops in primary secondary, latent, and tertiary stages. Each stage, stage has different signs and symptoms. Newborns can get syphilis. Congenital syphilis is a disease that'll pass syphilis from uh, uh, to the babies dur during pregnancy. You can get syphilis through direct contact with a syphilis sore during sexual activity. And it's important to recognize that you can't get it through casual contact with objects. Next slide. So we really, individuals should be tested after unprotected sex. If there's any take home message, uh, that's one, one place that I think we, we really, really do understand. And we've been able to, at least within our products, really try to highlight. But testing is generally recommended at, uh, at least for 
mothers at the first prenatal visit, 28 weeks, and then at delivery again. Uh, that's to ensure that we've detected congenital syphilis early enough to engage in treatment. And there are, there are syphilis testing uh, recommendations for those who engage in high-risk behaviors, and they're listed there. You can see that, you know, the last two are really related to being in environments that uh, where syphilis may be more prevalent, communities with high rates of syphilis, those who are homeless, those who may be incarcerated. Uh, that's... <clears throat> Those are places where we would want to increase screening as well, testing and screening. Thank you. Next slide. So we know that while there are four stages of syphilis, primary, secondary, and tertiary is the most common, there's also a latent phase. And during the primary stage, they, uh, an individual may notice that there's a single sore or multiple sores, and that could be in a location where the syphilis has entered the body. Um, and the sores usually are firm, round, and painless. And because of the, they're painless, sometimes people don't notice. And even after it goes away, um, individuals still must receive treatment. During the secondary stage, it becomes much more noticeable. That's where there's skin rashes and sores around the mouth, sinus, the vagina or anus. And once this rash starts in one area, it'll show up in other areas where the primary sore may be healing, but there'll be secondary sores available uh, that'll be readily seen. These are typically rough, red, reddish brown. They don't itch and sometimes they're faint. So sometimes folks don't notice it right away, but other symptoms will include fever, sore throat, uh, sometimes headaches, weight loss, muscle aches. We often call syphilis the, the the, the great imposter, because uh, it can mimic almost any other disease. Then it goes into this latent phase where there are no visible signs. And without treatment, the individual will continue to have syphilis within the body, but it may not necessarily be seen until the late stages of tertiary syphilis. Um, and the, the problem is, is that that will affect many organ systems. The heart, the brain, the nervous system are the ones that we know the most about. Um, and it will affect the internal organs and can occur anywhere from 10 to 30 years after the initial infection. You know, we've heard of neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, and for instance, and syphilis will spread to the brain. And those signs and symptoms will be quite severe. But there is effective treatment. Next slide, please. So the great news is, is that not only is there effective treatment, there's at least one treatment that can be given at a single injection. And it's important to recognize that as long that the federal government is working towards ensuring that there is adequate supply of both penicillin G and doxypep. Now, doxypep is the oral, uh, oral medication that needs to be taken, uh, and that will be taken for 14 days at least. Uh, to ensure that the syphilis is properly treated. And not only have there been federal efforts uh, to, to do this, but also educational efforts to healthcare providers to help them and their patients decide which medication is best for them. And I will at least say that it is, um, it is important to recognize that even though you were, if you were treated for syphilis uh, with penicillin or doxycycline, you can contract syphilis again. So it's important for follow-up testing when, uh, when risky behavior exposure may have occurred again. Next slide. So TB, um, you know, what we, we talk about TB being a little bit different because this is caused by a bacteria and it's, it's, it causes TB, uh, and there's readily symptoms that most people will see. They'll cough, they'll sneeze, and it's a spread through respiratory droplets. Uh, it usually affects the lungs, but it can affect other parts of the body as well, um, the lymph nodes in particular. And there's two main conditions for TB, both active and inactive. And if not treated, certainly TB can be fatal. It, it's important to recognize that this is curable, it's preventable. Um, I know there was a question about the 
uh, in the pre-registration about the effectiveness uh, of the PPD versus the blood test. Certainly the PPD as a point of care test is very effective in detecting, uh, uh, detecting TB. But uh, there, are, there are some conditions that will lead to, to false positives and blood tests generally are uh, confirmatory. Uh, just they're unwieldy as a, as a point of care test when it comes to TB. Um, next slide. So why have we been talking about all of this? Individuals with substance use disorder or mental illness have increased risk of contracting these conditions. And individuals with these conditions have increased risk of developing a substance use disorder or a mental illness. We also know that if we don't treat one, the, the other condition typically gets worse. And that's important to recognize that uh, the holistic approach to care really does involve addressing both conditions simultaneously. Um, understanding that compliance with behavioral health medications will go down when the physical disease is active and acute, and as well as uh, compliance with sometimes very long or complicated regimens of infectious disease medication. That also uh, can be affected by a person's mental health status. Next slide. So I, I took, uh, I wanted to highlight this slide just for the, the last column with hepatitis C. Uh, and you can see that when we compare the physical health conditions with individuals with severe mental illness, the, the rates of hepatitis C are 17.2% compared to 1%. Uh, of the general population. And when I was training in DC, we also knew that many individuals with severe mental illness were not getting their healthcare needs addressed because sometimes the providers were either, their behavioral health providers may not have had the bandwidth or the training to deal with those other conditions. Sometimes their physical health providers dismissed some of their symptoms and complaints. And we knew that individuals were actually living about 20 years less. Individuals with severe mental illness were living about 20 years less than those with without. And well, there's there's things that we can do that'll uh, that through education of the workforce, education of those stakeholders and and those caregivers, as well as the patients can can do wonders to, to address that disparity. Next slide. So Really, we, we want to ensure that individuals understand prevention efforts. Those are risk. We understand that if an individual has a, has a risk factor, that they're educated on it. And we know that with implementation of evidence-based screening tools, preventive interventions, and clinical treatments, that, that really good outcomes are, are not only possible, but expected. And we can prevent the spread of infection, reduce mortality in vulnerable populations. And we also know that because drug use may weaken the immune system and lead to risky behaviors such as needle sharing and unsafe sex, so that these individuals may have greater likelihood. So the educational efforts are really, uh, are really the, the other cornerstone to ensuring that the, the risks related to the education, uh, the education really can affect decreasing the risks for contracting uh, infectious diseases and spreading and transmitting those infectious diseases. We have a number of resources Kristen's going to go into more detail about. We have our technology transfer centers. I'll just mention that they can offer sustainable or at least answers to questions on how to develop sustainable models of healthcare delivery that integrate healthcare when it comes to infectious disease. We also have, not mentioned here, but worth, uh, uh, worth for a moment, mentioning a number of educational resources that are available at the SAMHSA store uh, that you can take a look at and download. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kristen Roja to begin her part of the talk. Oh, I'm sorry. One more slide. This is just an example of the uh, some of the partnerships we've had 
Uh, we've listened to our state partners. We've had technical expert panels. We haven't gotten this information just on our own. We've heard it from everyone else. We've also developed some regulations uh, that may help with the sharing of uh, with information such as 42 CFR part two with in conjunction with the Office of Civil Rights. We worked with the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. Uh, and we understand that there's a lot more to do. And we believe this partnership is going to be uh, not only fruitful now, but it will help educate us as we develop policies in the future. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Kristen now. Thank you very much. Uh, so what I'm going to do is quickly walk through uh, SAMHSA's syndemic approach to addressing communicable diseases, as well as some resources that we have that you can use as you implement uh, or in, are interested in learning more about uh, implement, uh, implementing a communicable disease or infectious disease um, program within a substance use disorder uh, or behavioral health care space. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with a brief discussion of healthcare silos. I'm sure we're all familiar with the term healthcare silos, uh, which have been bar has borrowed from agriculture to describe physical and non-physical boundaries arising between uh, divisional units of a healthcare system. And healthcare silos harm patients and frustrate providers because patients have to navigate multiple healthcare systems to get the care that they need. Next slide, please. So some of uh, this. Uh, list grew out of a, a, a previous uh, session in which the, the attendees were asked to brainstorm some silos that SAMHSA clients might uh, encounter. And so we see here everything from housing to dental care to STIs to HIV uh, to food, uh, even veterinary care if they are um, you know, experiencing homelessness with, uh, with uh, companion animals. Uh, next slide, please. So the term syndemic, this is uh, HHS's official definition of syndemic. Uh, syndemics happen when two or more diseases or health conditions cluster and interact within a population because of social and structural factors and inequities, leading to excess burden of disease and continuing health disparities. In a syndemic, social and structural factors like lack of quality health care, poverty, or violence can make people more likely to be exposed to and experience adverse disease or health conditions. Having one health condition can also make people biologically or behaviorally more likely to acquire another illness or experience worse outcomes. Uh, and the term syndemic was first used in 1994 to describe the intersection of substance use disorder, AIDS, and violence in American cities. Next slide, please. So a syndemic approach seeks to understand the connections between interacting health conditions, disease, and social and structural determinants of health and inequities, and to act collectively to address the needs of the whole person and communities. Taking a syndemic approach to understand and address the interactions of HIV, STIs, viral hepatitis, substance use, mental illness, and other syndemic conditions can identify new opportunities to intervene that may be invisible when each condition is viewed separately and lead to improved general health and well-being. And this, the information on this slide is also from the HHS definition of syndemics. I believe the link for which was on the prior slide. So how does that um, manifest in SAMHSA's work? So, uh, and, and Dr. Gandotra already uh, referenced uh, SAMHSA's strategic plan. Uh, I'm going to focus on um, the uh, priority area that's highlighted in green, integrating behavioral and physical health care, which is under that umbrella is where a lot of this work addressing infectious disease in a behavioral health care space falls. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to read everything on this slide, uh, integrating, but uh, this is priority area four, integrating behavioral and physical health care, which in the strategic plan has two goals. The first is to promote whole person care and improve health outcomes. SAMHSA will advance bi-directional integration of health care services across systems for people with behavioral health conditions. And goal two is to promote whole person care and improve health outcomes. SAMHSA will advance policies and programs to address social determinants of health. And so we can see in, in these two goals that social determinants of health that are baked into the infectious disease and uh, behavioral health care uh, components of um, what Dr. Gandosha was speaking about and then what I was talking about when I was discussing um, the definition of syndemic. Next slide, please. 
So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this slide and the next one. However, I've been assured that the slides will be distributed in the coming days. So you can read these, but these are um, examples of integrated behavioral and physical health care that are provided in the strategic plan. So if you have the strategic plan, you'll see these as well. So now let's talk about SAMHSA's syndemic approach and how it's implemented. We have our block grants. Um, we have the Community Mental Health and Services Block Grant. And this is an old, an old uh, name. It is no longer called the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant. Um, it is the uh, Substance use prevention and treatment uh, block grant. We also have five minority AIDS initiative funded grant programs that are separate from the block grant. Uh, one that is funded by CSAP, uh, one that is jointly funded by CSAP and CSAT, two others that are funded by CSAT and one that's funded by CMHS. I will get into details in the coming slides. There's also the harm reduction grant program, but there are 15 other grant programs that include HIV viral hepatitis or STIs services in some way uh, integrated into the behavioral health component of those grant programs. The populations of focus are on the bottom of your screen. I'm not going to read them, but rather to say that the way that the infectious disease components are included in that those grant programs are really tailored to the needs of the uh, population of focus. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go into the block grant in too much detail other than to say that uh, states that have a a uh, case rate of 10 cases of AIDS per 100,000 of the population uh, are con considered HIV designated states and thus have a 5% set aside to address HIV early intervention services. That's for HIV in particular. If we go to the next slide, I'm also not going to go into this one in too great detail, other than to say that there are three limited cases in which block grant funding can be used for viral hepatitis or STIs. The three, uh, instances in which it can be used are briefly indicated on your slide. Please reach out to your state project officer if you have questions about this in more detail and moving on in the interest of time as well. So then quickly again, in the interest of time, uh, these are the grant programs other than the block grant that incorporate or sort of like the flagship programs that incorporate infectious disease work into a behavioral health care space. The first is um, offered out of CSAT, the Minority AIDS Initiative High-Risk Populations Grant Program. This increases engagement in care for racial and ethnic medically underserved individuals with substance use disorder and or co-occurring substance use and mental health conditions who are at risk for or living with HIV. Next slide, please. The next, which is funded by the Minority HIV AIDS Fund last year and this year funded through the Minority AIDS Initiative is the Portable Clinical Care Pilot Project. This grant program incorporates a syndemic approach by utilizing low barrier substance use disorder treatment, mental health care, HIV and viral hepatitis testing and treatment, HIV prevention, including condoms, PrEP and PEP, into, and harm reduction services to people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Next slide, please. Then new in FY24 is the Minority AIDS Initiative Substance Use Disorder Prevention and Treatment Pilot Project. This is braided funding through CSAP and CSAT, and this grant program um, provides substance use prevention, substance use disorder treatment, HIV, viral hepatitis prevention and treatment services, and um, other services, including STIs, um, combining the efforts that previously have been separated by CSAP into CSAP and CSAT grant portfolios. Uh, so there's one grant cohort, the uh, recipients of which will be uh, announced imminently. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, then uh, similarly, out of uh, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, the Prevention Navigator Grant Program, this is the prevention arm of the SAMHSA's Minority AIDS Initiative grant portfolio. And this grant program provides training and education around the risks of substance misuse and HIV, as well as the integration of a range of services for individuals with HIV. The program uses a navigation approach, working with community health workers, neighborhood navigators, and peer support specialists to expedite services to these populations. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, uh, the Center for Mental Health Services provides the service integration grant program. This reduces the co-occurrence of uh, co-occurring ep epidemics of HIV, hepatitis, and mental health challenges through accessible evidence-based culturally appropriate treatment that is integrated with HIV primary care and prevention services. Next slide, please. 
Oh, last one, the harm reduction grant program. Uh, the purpose of this program is to support community-based overdose prevention programs, syringe service programs, and other harm reduction services. And this is funded through the Center uh, for Substance Abuse Prevention. Next slide, please. Lastly, I do want to have a brief note on the inclusion of people with lived and living experience. Beginning in FY23, uh, CSAT and now CSAT and CSAP and FY24 have included language in their Minority AIDS Initiative grant programs uh, to um, emphasize the importance of incorporating people with lived and living experience in all levels of program implementation, including leadership. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read the language from the FY24 grant programs, but they're there on your slide and you can refer to them once we circulate them. But the reason that this language was included is after hearing often from the both the HIV and substance use disorder communities that people with lived and living experience may not have the same educational attainment as uh, people without that lived experience, and as a result may be unable to be promoted within their, their organizations. So this language is to indicate that uh, people with lived and living experience can be treated um, similarly to education as appropriate. Next slide, please. So quickly, I want to talk about emerging syndemics, and Dr. Yandotra referenced this earlier. Uh, next slide, please. First, and we haven't really talked about MPOX yet, but SAMHSA did, uh, was part of the governmental response to the MPOX public health emergency in 2022 by issuing a Dear Colleagues letter, the link to which is on your screen uh, on the slide, uh, that clarified the use of SAMHSA grant funds for uh, MPOX, the MPOX response. Next slide, please. Uh, SAMHSA is also involved, of course, in the syphilis syndemic that is currently occurring across the country, and Dr. Gandotra referenced the National Syphilis and Congenital Syphilis Syndemic Task Force that is led by the Assistant Secretary for Health. Uh, we issued a Dear Colleagues letter uh, in January 2024 that uh, clarified the use of SAMHSA grant funds for um, to address the syphilis syndemic. Uh, I have excerpted the key section of that um, in terms of funding on the screen at the right. Uh, so you can reference that um, in the slides. Uh, but briefly, uh, the bolded portion indicates that SAMHSA grant recipients may use their grant funds to address the syphilis syndemic by providing syphilis and other STI screening, testing, and referral to treatment in conjunction with SAMHSA-supported work. If you have more questions about how you can use SAMHSA grant funds to address the syphilis syndemic, please refer to the uh, dear colleagues letter, as well as reaching out to your government project officer or state project officer if you have more questions. Next slide, please. We also have a resource, uh, samhsa.gov slash syphilis, that you can refer to that has uh, resources for um, behavioral health care practitioners who may want to know more about syphilis. I know that all of us were un, un not expecting a rise in syphilis cases to take place in the past couple of years, and as a result, uh, may need a refresher. So the information for that is on your slide, uh, on that uh, website, samsa.gov slash syphilis. Next slide, please. Uh, we also issued a Dear OTP Director letter in May 2024. Uh, again, the, this letter was to the OTP directors uh, to um, indicate the ways that OTPs can uh, be leveraged to address the syphilis endemic. Once again, I have excerpted the key paragraph. However, um, if you have questions, uh, please refer to the Dear Colleagues letter. And if you have more questions, uh, to your government or state project officer. Next slide, please. Finally, and hot off the presses, at the end of August, we issued a Dear Colleagues letter to talk about the new clinical guidelines for the use of doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis, or doxypep. These guidelines were updated by CDC in June. So this Dear Colleagues letter um, alerts folks to the updated clinical guidelines, as well as clarifying the use of SAMHSA grant funds for doxypep. Again, uh, once again on the slide, I have excerpted the key funding specific language, which indicates that SAMHSA grant recipients providing direct mental health and or substance use prevention and treatment services may now use their grant funds to address the nationwide rise in STI cases by supporting access to doxypep following CDC's clinical guide guidelines as part of SAMHSA supported work 
um, su support allowable activities. This includes, but is not limited to, a wide list of um, activities that you can see in the bullet points on, the, on your screen there. Again, if you have questions, please reach out. We also, by the way, I forgot to mention, we have a special email address for questions for syphilis. It's syphilisfaq at samhsa.hhs.gov. So if you have questions about the use of SAMHSA grant funds to address the syphilis syndemic, syphilisfaq at samhsa.hhs.gov. Next slide, please. So quickly, um, I'm going to run through some other resources that are available. Uh, to incorporate into your um, repertoire of information as we talk about incorporating infectious disease work into a behavioral health space. The first are quickly just some federal guiding documents, the National HIV AIDS Strategy. Uh, this goes through 2025 and provides the federal government's vision for addressing uh, HIV across the country. And SAMHSA is a participating uh, agency in the National HIV AIDS Strategy or NHAS. Next slide. The Viral Hepatitis National Strategic Plan also through 2025, and similar to the National HIV AIDS Strategy, uh, this is the same, but for viral hepatitis, and SAMHSA is a participating agency for this as well. Next slide, please. And lastly, the National STI Strategic Plan also through 2020, uh, 2025. So the National HIV AIDS Strategy, the Viral Hepatitis Strategy, and the STI Strategy really allow our, our sort of our, our guiding documents as we craft our, our response to these infectious diseases uh, within the behavioral health care space. Next slide, please. We also have our training and technical assistance. Um, uh, the SAMHSA funds. We currently fund over 40 training and technical assistance initiatives that offer professional skill development and implementation support to those on the behavioral health field. This includes the technology transfer centers, including the addiction technology transfer center, the prevention technology transfer center, and the um, mental health technology transfer center. We also have the training and technical assistance centers um, uh, that support a variety of other clinicians. Next slide, please. We also fund centers of excellence, including centers of excellence for integrated health solutions, the African American Behavioral Health Center of Excellence, the Center for, of Excellence for Behavioral Health Disparities in Aging, and the Center of Excellence for LGBTQ plus Behavioral Health Equity, the links for which are on your slides. Next slide, please. We also publish some resources that can be referenced um, as you are looking to it for ways to implement infectious disease work into behavioral health spaces. The first of which I'd like to highlight is the prevention and treatment of HIV among people living with substance use and or mental disorders. This guide highlights five evidence-based practices that can be used among people living with substance use or mental disorders uh, to prevent and treat HIV. Next slide, please. And the links to all of these resources are on the slides. So once you receive them, you could just click through uh, to access the resources that you would like. Uh, finally, uh, next we have a, an advisory treating substance use disorder among people living with HIV. Uh, this is a, a brief, I believe it's like 12 pages long and tells you exactly what it says on the tin, treating substance use disorder among people living with HIV. Next slide, please. SAMHSA also recently published the Harm Reduction Framework, which is the first document to comprehensively outline harm reduction and discuss its role throughout HHS. The framework informs SAMHSA's harm reduction activities moving forward, as well as related topics, policies, programs, and practices. Next slide, please. We also, now this is older, it's published in November 2016, the case for behavioral health screening in HIV care settings. Uh, so this um, discusses uh, the screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment, as well as um, other topics related to this. It is a little bit older um, in 2016, but still available. Next slide, please. Uh, we then have screening and treatment for viral hepatitis in people with substance use disorders. This is another brief advisory. It updates a previous, uh, a previous tip, tip 53, and includes um, really great information. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, links to everything will be on your screen. Uh, this, your guide to integrating hepatitis C services into opioid treatment programs. This was released in April, 2020 by the Addiction Technology Transfer Center and uh, is exactly what it says on, um, on the top. The 
uh, the, the front page, which is a guide to integrating hepatitis C services into OTPs um, and is a really great resource. Next slide, please. Um, so I don't know if you know, but in April 2020, there's a lot going on in the world and the world changed. So they reissued a 2023 supplement that includes COVID related challenges and considerations, as well as um, hepatitis C advancements since 2020 and includes some really uh, useful case studies. Next slide, please. And that's my last slide. Uh, so now I will turn it back over to Matthew for the Q&A. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you, Dr. Gandotra. At this time, we will begin the question and answer segment of the presentation. If you've not already done so, please submit your questions by using the Q&A feature that's located on the bottom center of your screen. Our first question. Can you share any best practice recommendations for preparedness to identify and respond to emerging public health communicable diseases? Uh, thank you for that question. I, I will say that uh, SAMHSA has in our store a, uh, a guidebook on disaster planning, um, uh, maintain, uh, delivering behavioral health care and disaster planning. It's available on in our SAMHSA store. We did utilize that many principles with regard to that during the COVID-19 public health um, emergency. Uh, and we've updated it in 2021. Uh, and there is a whole chapter on, a, on dealing with a pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Gandotra. And that resource is, in, is available in the chat. Our second question. Are federal agencies considering any blended funding for communicable disease testing, specifically viral hepatitis B and C? So we, we certainly are considering uh, a number of things, including uh, braided funding. Uh, but I, can, I really can't speak to the appropriations process and where that stands today, but certainly within our uh, from our standpoint, we are considering it, yes. Our next question. Can you provide any comments regarding TB screening with PPD versus blood test? So I, I think I did address this in the, um, uh, in the uh, presentation, but in essence, point of care testing is more or less with... Uh, uh, the purified protein derivative, PPD, is very effective and efficient, but it does yield some false positives. And blood test is confirmatory and, uh, and certainly utilize when there is a positive and there is no, uh, and there is no history of uh, a, a factor that might have led to that false positive, such as a previous BCG vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Gandotra. Thank you, Kristen. A reminder that if you have not already done so, to please submit your questions by using the Q&A feature that's located on the bottom center of your screen. One of our questions submitted this afternoon, uh, Kristen hit on a, a little bit, but I still wanna give you the opportunity to provide any other comments. Uh, will SAMHSA or other federal agencies be providing any guidance and or funding to focus on one, identifying people with viral hepatitis, and two, getting people linked to care via making viral hepatitis testing within SUD treatment centers? So I, I believe Kristen may answer this in more detail, but we already provide within various grant programs uh, the provision for uh, for testing uh, for viral hepatitis, particular minority AIDS initiative uh, grants, but I'll also turn it over to Kristen if she wants anything to add to that. Uh, certainly. So there are um, all of the minority AIDS initiative funded grant programs do provide or require rather uh, viral hepatitis work in some way, including hepatitis C testing. Uh, there is also some, but not as much uh, provision of that within the substance use prevention and treatment block grant funding. Um, following that, 
Um, there it is included in some other of our discretionary grant programs, but again, that's dependent on the population of focus, so it may not be included in all of them. So SAMHSA does do this work with hepatitis C in a variety of ways uh, that's really tailored to the population of focus and the funding source, so it's like a triangulation between those. Awesome. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Dr. Gandotra. Seeing no other questions, we will now move forward with the webinar. Next slide, please. A reminder that states can access technical assistance and resources through the SAMHSA State TA Project. To access technical assistance, states can do so by emailing the State TA team at SAMHSA State TA at jbsinternational.com or by uh, visiting the statea.samsa.gov landing page. Next slide. So um, we do ask that each person, each attendee, uh, completes our survey for today's webinar. Uh, the surveys are especially important as we use your feedback to shape future webinars. To access today's survey, you can do so by using your smartphone to scan the QR code on the slide you see here, or by accessing the link that is also made available in the chat. A reminder that once the webinar closes for today, the link will be available so that you can take as much time as needed to complete your survey. Slides will be made available to each participant uh, in the coming days, as well as the recording for today's presentation. As we wrap up today's webinar, we want to thank each of the attendees for taking the time to be here this afternoon, as well as our presenters, Dr. Gandotra and Ms. Roja, for uh, taking the time to provide their expertise. And with that, we wish each of you a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at a webinar very soon. Thank you.